Hi everyone, my name is José Alexandre Felizola Diniz Filho. I'm a professor at the Department of Ecology, Federal University of Goiás in central Brazil. And it's a pleasure to open this section of the ENM 2020, the online course in ecological niche modeling, discussing with you some of the research frontiers in the field. Thank you, Tom, for organizing everything and for inviting me for this very challenging task. So uh, my goal here with this talk is to highlight some new developments in the field that may provide new research avenues based on two very general ideas. First, integration between different areas and fields of ecology and evolutionary biology. And second, the capacity to deal with patterns and processes at different scales, both in geographical space and hierarchical levels, from individuals to populations and from populations to species or assemblages. It's, of course, very difficult to avoid some personal bias in looking forward to such advances. So I'll show you some of the ideas that were developed in our research group in the last 15 or 20 years or so. Um, in summary, to try to achieve these goals, my plan is to talk to you about the following talks. Let's start with a very brief overview of ENMs, but focusing on the evolution and dynamics of ecological niches and geographical ranges. More specifically, let's emphasize the geographical components of adaptation and evolutionary rescue under climate change. Then let's move to a large scale and talk about the simulation of species dynamics under these population level processes. Finally, some taking home messages. Let's start with the quick overview. By now, you already know everything about ENMs in terms of getting data, fitting and testing models and projecting these models to get a description of the geographical range and environmental suitability in current, past, or future environments. This is the very standard idea of ENMs. And in this context, it's quite, quite usual to think first in some general conceptual issues, and here the main, the main thing is the niche theory, then move to methodological aspects such as model fit, evaluation, algorithms, uh, projections, data, and then finally think about applications in terms of biological invasions, discovery of new species, climate change, systematic conservation planning, public health, and many other ideas. This is basically what you have been discussing in the last uh, months. Uh, in terms of niche theory, it's quite usual to think or to start with the famous BAM diagram overlaying the biotic Abiot can move components to help us understanding the constraints that determine the geographical ranges of the species. Of course, other more complex ways to overlap B, A, and M components exist, as Town or Red show you, for example, in Wallace's work. But let's keep simple, let's keep with the uh, standard uh, and classic BAM diagram and think that even if a region um, is accessible to the species, right here, the M component, um, the species may not persist in those places for different reasons. So we are actually talking about uh, uh, source sync dynamics because the species can achieve those places, but they will not persist there because growth rate is negative in this place. So although we usually think in BAM diagrams in terms of niche space and link this with niche theory, as Jorge Soberon already discussed it with you in great detail, we are actually talking about the potential population dynamics in, G in each part of the BAM diagram. So population dynamics matters. Under this reasoning, we expected a positive relationship between environmental suitabilities as estimated by ENMs and empirical estimates of abundance, right? We expected a positive relationship between abundance and ENM suitability in the sense that places that are more suitable to the species in terms of the environment that we use in the ENMs to, the, to, to create the model uh, will have more individuals of, of that species. So we have a positive relationship. There are, of course, many difficulties to, to, to calculate and to estimate this relationship because there are many statistical issues, many sampling problems, a lack of data. But in general, you can see here, for example, that the, this prediction in general the prediction holds, so we have an average more or less 0.4 uh, in this um, analysis with combining uh, 
the information for hundreds of species. So we have, in general, a positive relationship between abundance and environmental suitability. Putting this in a more explicit geographical context, context let's think that uh, a species range uh, under climate change uh, will shift so we can better see uh, these different regions in geographical space. Suppose that for a species with a given uh, geographical range, a light green area here, right? this is the, let's say, original species range, the climate change will cause a northward shift in the range. So uh, the, the future range is the dark green region here. So the species will tend to go extinct in this part of the range that we call the trailing edge. Actually, the populations here will be think po sink populations with a negative growth rate, right? The R here will be negative, right? We have a lambda smaller than one and R smaller than zero. So they are sink populations. But um, th there's a nice question here, right? Why extinction and not adaptation? To answer this question, it's very important to better understand what's going on in this region here, in the range border or in the uh, trailing edge under climate change. In practice, uh, in, 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 in ENMs, we think that the range limits are defined mainly by tolerance. That's why we have the extinction here. But why populations cannot adapt to this new border or new trailing edge conditions so the species could expand its range indefinitely? That's exactly the question that Mark Kirkpatrick and Nick Barton, Barton tried to answer based on the old central peripheral theory of Ernest Meyer in a paper published in MNAT in 1997. The overall idea is that populations in the range borders or in the trailing edges could adapt to local conditions such as a hotter environment in, in, our, in our case, if we think in northern, northern hemisphere, um, in our previous example, but uh, if there's genetic variability and the conditions so that adaptation happens. No, no big deal, this is very classic uh, idea and theory of natural selection. However, the problem with species range is that if we have more central populations with higher suitability and higher abundance, as we already discussed, these central populations will tend to send more colonizers to the borders. In the populations in the borders, on the other hand, with lower abundance and lower fitness, there will be no migrants to the central region of the range. So there would be an asymmetric gene flow in a central peripheral dynamics. Consequently, Genes adapted to the environments in central part of the range uh, with the, will be carried on by the migrants and will tend to constrain the adaptation process in the border or in the trailing edge. So the species range would be determined not only by the overall tolerance limits, but by the equilibrium between adaptation and gene flow, depending on the strength, on the re relative strength of these opposing forces, ranges would be exceedingly small or very, very large. There are, of course, many discussions around this model, some alternative views, but I think that the overall idea is quite interesting and quite useful to help us understanding uh, population dynamics, evolution, and range dynamics. So we are actually talking about the evolution and dynamics of ecological niches and geographical ranges. It's curious that the, this idea of evolution of niches in terms of comparison among different species is, of course, not new and goes back, let's say, to the uh, ecological genetics in the 1940s, to the numerical taxonomy in the 1970s, uh, where some researchers uh, proposed, for example, to use ecological traits to classify species and compare the, the, res the results with the standard uh, taxonomic classification. Um, this was, was uh, very common and, and also the, the community ecology stuff uh, comparing different species in functional terms. So there are many ways to think that comparison among niches is not new. But in this more specific context of ENMs, I think that this started to be more explicitly discussed in uh, Paul Peterson, Jorge Soberon and Sanchez Cordero paper um, published in Science in 1999, where they discussed and they created the uh, 
they developed the idea of niche conservatism. As they put in the end of the abstract, uh, niche conservatism over such small scales indicate that speciation takes place in a geographical and not ecological dimension and that ecological differences evolve later. So, there's an underlying evolution, evolutionary model when thinking about niche conservatism since the beginning. The model is that ecological difference, ecological similarity between the, the, the two or more species evolve after the geographical speciation. So, the niches tend to be conserved even if we already have two species, two different species living in different places, right? Um, but uh, I think that this idea was not widely developed for a while in terms of coupling this with niche models. And people working with uh, ecological niche modeling did not a lot, paid a lot of attention to this paper in the first moment, even, even because, as we're going to see a bit later, this is not trivial. Um, and I think that what happened is that niche conservatism started to be investigated in a much broader scale using evolutionary models in the context of phylogenetic comparative methods, uh, especially after this paper by Jonathan Lozes published in the College Letters in 2008. But um, let's not forget that most, if not all, applications of ENMs assume that uh, species are in equilibrium with current climate, so that th those models are actually static. And this is indeed expected over very short time scales. But uh, we know that niches evolve, that's for sure, and time for evolution in terms of, let's say, of number of generations uh, depends on, on organisms' life cycles, and um, adaptation depends on the magnitude and strength of the environmental pressures. So, in, in one hand, I think that ENM help us understanding the geographical components of niche dynamics under climate change, assuming equilibrium. On the other hand, phylogenetic analysis of niche conservatism allow us to think in evolutionary dynamics and niches at much broader spaces, scales at species level. And we have some way to try to couple these two ideas. I think that a, a very interesting thing that uh, appears when we, we deal with comparative analysis uh, is to define niche variables as species traits. But of course, there are many issues also to discuss here, especially if we think in terms of defining fundamental and realized niches, as Colin Soberon already discussed it with you. But anyway, we have to think in, in how to couple these two ideas and think about evolution, evolutionary dynamics, both in large and small uh, time and phylogenetic scales. So, to, to try to start thinking about this, let's go back to the BAM diagram and to the idea of sourcing dynamics. Uh, let's think that what is happening in that uh, trailing edge in terms of extinction. Uh, because the this part of the species range becomes unsuitable, we are thinking that this population is a sink population, so growth rate is negative. So this will lead to extinction because in these populations, in this region here of the range, the, the population dynamics will go, will follow this kind of trajectory. And actually we can even, uh, if you have a negative growth rate, right, we can even calculate the time expected for extinction in this, in this population. Uh, but um, we have to think that using, in a, in a broader evolutionary context in terms of population modeling, actually the population growth rate is mean fitness of the population that we can see here, right? This is the intrinsic growth rate, this is lambda, so actually in a simple discrete time population model, this is actually fitness, right? So again, what has happened is that fitness is being reduced, the population is not able to keep to persist in this area because uh, there are no new uh, individuals to compensate the loss and the death of the old individuals in, the, in this region. So, but what happens if we can bring back this fitness to a higher level by adaptation, right? Again, what if these populations in trailing edge adapt? In middle 1999, some population geneticists and evolutionary biologists start to think more deeply about this 
And I, I really like these two papers by Holt and uh, Michael Lynch uh, groups. Um, and I, I think that the main idea here is to apply the idea of evolutionary dynamics to, in, to an environmental condition changing gradually and leading species to extinction so that uh, adaptation can be a process that will help species or populations to avoid extinction. So we're, we're basically talking about the very well-known process of natural selection and adaptation. The first thing to, to understand uh, this process is to think in terms of the fitness function, which describes the relationship between a trait and the mean fitness in the population. Let's think, for example, that the trait here is preferred temperature, is a, is a surrogate of all the metabolical and physiological processes that is happen, happening within the organism, right? Um, so we have the preferred temperature here and we have the pop mean population fitness here. If we think, for example, that we are in the trailing edge of the range, in the first moment the species was very well adapted to those environmental conditions. We can think that it was before in equilibrium with the condition and it has, the population has uh, maximum fitness, let's say uh, one here, this is relative fitness, right? But then we have the environmental changes and the population becomes uh, a sink population because uh, they, they, it, it cannot deal with, let's say, a much hotter uh, temperature there. So the temperature, the environmental temperature will not match the preferred temperature anymore and the fitness is now 0.4. And the new temperature in that region is about, let's say, 40, right? So this is the new adaptive peak in that region. And the idea is that if there's enough genetic variation or adaptive potential or proper uh, demographic conditions, and this is the, the, the rate of evolution, the potential rate of evolution is expressed here. There are the details here, but the overall idea is that the population must climb the hill and they it try to increase its fitness, its fitness to go up to the new adaptive peak. And when this happens, it, the preferred temperature will try to match the environmental uh, temperature, so the fitness goes back to one, right? This is the, the, the standard idea in terms of uh, fitness function, and you can think, for example, in a multivariate way with several niche dimensions, we could think in an adaptive landscape. It's much more complex because there, there are many other parameters. And here we are also assuming that this function is fixed. And as we are going to see in a, in a second, uh, in Lynch's model, for example, this, this function is, is changed in continuous load. But the idea is just the same, but the peak will, will be not instantaneously shifted from, let's say, uh, 23 to 42, right? The, the peak will change uh, gradually also, and the population will try to track this new peak, this moving peak. But the overall idea is the same. The population must track uh, the new peak by following the fitness function that you can see uh, here. But the important point is that, okay, if this happens and if this population is able to climb the hill and go to this place here, its fitness will go back to, to one or to a very high level. So the growth rate actually is increasing. And what is the consequence of this? That's it. We had before an extinction process in which it, in, for a sink population, it starts, let's say, with 1,000 individuals here. It tends to decline and it goes to zero, so the population is extinct and the species will shift its range to the northern part of the domain. But what about adaptation? What if adaptation happens? Okay, population start to decrease, 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 but eventually it will be it, it will be possible to adapt if there's genetic variation and there are other things. So uh, it can goes up again and will recover. So it, the extinction will not happen. Adaptation will will occur, and the population will be able to persist in the new environment. And of course, you can already imagine that this adaptive process will lead to the evolution of niche, and niche will be slightly broader than it was before, right? Let's, let's take a look more explicitly in this process by using uh, an individual-based individual uh, simulation model uh, 
to, to, to take a look on this process really happening uh, in a virtual world, of course. Let's start thinking that we have a population here and we have a, a variable that can be, for example, preferred temperature. We, as we saw, we can start by thinking that this is the optimum, this is the environmental temperature, so the preferred temperature matches very well the preferred temperature, although, of course, there's a random variation around this because here we are seeing the phenotype, the prefer preferred temperature of different individuals. But the, the, these individuals vary both because they have different genes and because they have uh, plasticity and they have different environmental components. So this is the overall phenotypic variation, but not all these variations is actually, let's say, genetic variation. Actually, the irritability here is about 0.3. Only 30% of this variation we observed here is due to genetic variation, right? The other is random environmental variation around this peak. So uh, what is going to happen is that I'm going to move this, opti this, this the environmental temperature in this direction. So we have a, a warming in the trailing edge of the range. So the population, the fitness of the populations, you can imagine the fitness of the population will be reduced. So what is going on by adaptation is that the mean of the populations will try to track the red line here. And so um, when, when adaptation uh, occurs, right, this, this, this red line here will gradually shift in this direction to, towards a larger, uh, higher temperature and the population will try to track this by evolving, by adaptation, as we, we saw before. And as a consequence, you see the genetic variance will go down, the population will start to go down, right, right? because the fitness is being lost and then you're going to see uh, all these dynamics here, right? So this is, this is a very simple um, simulation, actually it's, it's an individual-based simulation of uh, Michael Lynch's uh, model. Right. So let's see uh, what happens in a, in a first in a first place. Here, the environment is changing. It's the, the environment is becoming hotter and hotter, hotter. The population is trying to move. It's I'm, I'm talking in the sense, but what's happening is that uh, individuals that have genes that could be slightly more adapted to a hotter environment will tend to. Uh, to have more descendants, more, more, more offspring. So the, 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 the frequency of the individuals better adapted to hotter environments will have more chance to survive. So the population mean will start to change. But at the same time, the environment change again, change again, change again. So we have, let's say here, 100 generations uh, of change in the, the environment is changed and the population is trying to track this change. And what you can see here is that genetic variance decreases, as expected, this is a selection process, and the population size is decreasing, the bean fitness is also decreasing very fast. So here, what is going on is that adaptation failed, right? So the environmental peak is moving much faster than the mean population size, than the mean population uh, preferred temperature. So population is not able to track the environmental change and so extinction uh, will take place. Let's let's see this again. Well, now let's let's change uh, a bit the parameters and see what happens. See now the trajectory is slightly different. So in principle. This population is going much better in terms of trying to track. Although genetic variation was reduced, populations is a bit more stable, fitness is decreasing slightly. Uh, okay, at least in 100 generation, uh, the, the rate of speed, the speed of evolution of the population is trying to match, uh, is, is better matching the environmental change here. So in this case, uh, extinction is much uh, less probably the, than in the previous uh, situation, right? This is much better than before. And what I did here is to increase a bit the amount of genetic variance associated with preferred temperature, right? So this is very standard uh, natural selection theory, and it may help us understanding what can happen in the trailing edge 
of the range. Oh, here we go again. So you see that the trajectory is much, uh, much better in terms of trying to couple. And uh, what Lynch model is actually measuring is the, the, the relative rate of environmental change and the potential rate of change in the mean phenotype. So if, the, if these two matches, if they match, so adaptation is, is likely or is possible. If not, if the mean change, mean phenotype is changing slower, the maximum rate of potential change in the mean phenotype is lower than the rate of environmental change, extinction will be inevitable, right? So in this context, all, all these idea that uh, I showed to you is having called evolutionary rescue, especially in this context of the new environmental changes. So in short, we had no evolution, so population density or population abundance will go down and the extinction will take place. But if, as we saw, adaptation occurs, it will tend to go down, but eventually adaptation can happen, so the populations will, be, will recover and the uh, extinction can be avoided. Now that we already know the, all the, the basic ideas, Let's uh, think more explicitly about the geographical components of evolutionary rescue under climate change. And uh, I think that the two main challenges here are to define the genetic basis of the, of the niche and transform the niche into a trait such as preferred temperature, as we are talking about. And also a challenge is to build the adaptive landscape or the adaptive uh, function. But there are... Um, several papers uh, discussing the ideas I pointed out before and trying to incorporate these evolutionary processes into ENMs, mainly in the context of climate change. In some cases, these papers applied mechanistic models, demographic and genetic models, for example, um, to understand population dynamics in different parts of the ranges and try to infer niche dynamics, but it's also possible to couple these models with the statistical background provided by the ENMs. And, and I'm going to briefly show you here um, our own attempt to, to deal with uh, these issues of adaptations and ENMs, um, which was published uh, last year in ecography, um, and that was derived from a workshop in our uh, National Institute of Science and Technology, as a, a, a program by our federal government um, that is called ENCT. Uh, and we have a project, a large project in ecology evolution and biodiversity conservation, uh, which is, ex in the focus of the project is exactly to integrate the several fields of genetics, ecology, evolution, um, physiology, right? Uh, and so in this workshop, we developed the basic ideas that I'm going to show you and that uh, was later published in this, uh, in ecography, right? Uh, let's use, uh, for example, as a, some, some kind of model organism to test our approach, a large amphibian, a frog, uh, widely distributed in central Brazil, the Rinella dipche. Um, and it's important also that we are going to focus on a single dimension of niche. We are only talking about temperature here, right? Um, as let's, let's think in terms of the preferred temperature. It's not so simple. We tried several ideas. There are also relationships important relationships for amphibians with humidity. So we could use uh, mean temperature in the, uh, in the dry, in the, the, the wetter uh, months and so on. Um, it does not make lots of difference, uh, at least in, 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 in this scale. But let's think about temperature here, right? The first thing we were going to see here is the very standard, uh, let's say, uh, ENM approach for Hinella Dipcha. And we use different methods in our um, ensemble forecast and approach, different uh, algorithms, different ma methods, and fit the model um, based on different variables, okay? So the ENM is based on several variables and for, on five different variables uh, collected or obtained for different a GCMs. No, no big deal here. Um, we have the suitability and you have the map of the suitability in the current environment. So this is our standard um, ensemble forecasting approach because we then projected the models into the future and we can see here the, uh, the, 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 the shift in the range 
in southwest southeastern direction and we have a loss of about eight five percent of the range area if we use a truncation here during about 50 percent of uh, model frequencies. Anyway, the important point here is that you have uh, a range shift, right? Um, and now we face the first challenge to add evolution to ENMs, that is to think about the fitness function for, let's say, preferred temperature. Uh, we have these performance curves from the from some ecophysiological experiments for this very particular species, and that's why one of the, that's one of the reasons why we we decided to work with this, this species. Um, and we have this very well known performance experiment that uh, define uh, the relative performance uh, at different temperatures, and in this case for different um, uh, humidity conditions, right? And it's interesting that this shaded area here, the limits of these shaded areas here in terms of the temperature, they will match quite well the limits of the temperature that we, we observe in, in range maps and occurrence of, of the species. So I think that this, this kind of experiment can give us uh, a first clue about fitness function and see that we what we are uh, talking about here is to build more realistic response curves integrating uh, knowledge from ecology and from physiology for uh, a given given species and there are many people working with this kind of idea in terms of trying to define limits maximum and minimum temperature limits for the species trying to build these curves and there's a lot of, of, of issues to discuss here, right? Um, there are many, many important things here. For example, uh, when thinking about this kind of curve and this kind of modeling that we are trying to do, uh, the first one is that we have to, to think about the, the, the genetic basis of these limits. And, and we even have to think about um, how these variables describing the niche should be defined and, and measured. For example, are, are we going to model the optimum or the preferred temperature? Again, we are thinking about some, some kind of mean temperature, or we are going to deal with the maximum and minimum temperatures. Um, are these curves, uh, these optimums or limits weakly or strongly inherited? We, you remember that we have, we must think about the irritability of these niche dimensions, dimensions, right? Uh, the second important issue here is that when people uh, build these curves, uh, they are actually based on experiments from, from in, using individuals. And it's not easy to translate the decay in performance and loss of fitness at population level. Of course, if temperature, for example, increases a lot, individuals die. But uh, this is some way trivial, right? What we have to know is how some small increases in temperature will affect the reproductive performance and how this can vary, this vary among individuals. There are, I think there are too many research opportunities here. This is a very, very promising area, I think, in terms of integration between ecology and evolution and, and thinking in all this comparative physiology stuff at both individual and population levels. In the paper, you can see how we try to overcome some of these difficulties, at least as a first approach to implement the couple evolutionary ENM model. Let me quickly show you the conceptual framework we, we use, and then we, we, already, we already saw this in that, uh, in that previous map when I showed you the trailing edge idea. Uh, but in short, we can go back to the, this range shift idea in terms of the region, separate the trailing edge, and see uh, in this diagram here, we are thinking in a south, south, uh, southern hemisphere change, so uh, the trailing edge is, is above here, is not below, right, the, the range. And um, the basic idea is to try to have the populations here, to, to define populations here in the trailing edge, and think if these populations could evolve against the temperature change here, or if they can go extinct. So we are thinking about niche conservatism process, and so the, these populations would go extinct and would persist only in this dark green region. And here, 
what can happen is that some of these populations, let's say the black circles here, could persist, could adapt to the new conditions in the border, whereas the more uh, distant populations with a more extreme climate change could not uh, could not have, could not evolve, and so they will go extinct. And in this case, we are talking about niche evolution. And here, the niche is just the same as before. And here, we're talking about niche evolution. I'm not going to deep in the in the details about the methodological framework. And um, we could apply that same kind of simulation I showed you before, but it's not necessary. Actually, we have analytical solutions. And the basic idea is to compare, as I told you before, the, the rate of evolution of the mean phenotype, let's say mean preferred temperature, and the rate of environmental change. And if, if environmental change is faster, then the mean trait is, able to, is capable to track so extinction will happen. Otherwise, adaptation will, will happen, right? OK, let's go to the real idea. Uh, I hope you have a better idea of what's going on with this, this figure here. Remember that we have a species that was almost anywhere in central Brazil. And after climate change, it will have, uh, we will, oops, we can, we, we, standard ENMs will predict uh, a south eastern uh, range shift in, in here, as you can see, and we, we lost about 85% of the range. So we have a large trailing edge here. And what you can see here in this map is the probability of uh, evolutionary rescue in, in the trailing edge. You see that for most part of the trailing edge, nothing will happen. It will be impossible to adapt, but to have a slightly higher probability of adaptation close to this northeast border of the, of the new uh, range limits after the climate change. But even so, we are talking about relatively low probability of evolutionary rescue, about 10%. And this is a probability, actually, because as we have a lot of uncertainty in the parameters, uh, we recalculated the relative rates of change um, hundreds, thousands of times uh, slightly changing the parameters and using different parameter combinations uh, to take into account the uncertainty. So we calculated uh, a probability of evolutionary rescue in different parts of the trailing edge. Um, we can also have a, a, a slightly different or slightly more sophisticated model in which we can incorporate phenotypic plasticity, which is very important when thinking about physiological parameters. And of course, we can see here that we have a much better response, and so species could persist in, much, in, a, in a much larger area of the trading edge and with a much higher probability, right? So uh, persistent will, persistence will be uh, very likely. But uh, the problem is that it's quite difficult to be sure about uh, this parameter of phenotypic plasticity, and we try to uh, extract the plasticity from those uh, experimental curves in terms of the variation in the ideal um, preferred temperatures. But anyway, uh, we have to think about better, better think about how to incorporate phenotypic plasticity in these uh, ideas, in this model, because the results are very sensitive to, to phenotypic plasticity. Um, it's also interesting to note that when thinking about this kind of, of model, um, we should not think only in the final time, let's say 2008, 2009 in this case, but we can think in a more continuous approach, because uh, as you saw in the simulations, uh, uh, it, the, the, the probability of extinction or the likelihood of extinction will depend in some sense in, of, of the, you know, from the time interval that we are thinking about. So we, have to, to, we can try to think in time-specific response uh, depending on the horizon, on the time horizon that we are uh, trying to, to estimate or to predict what is going on with those uh, populations. Well, after we developed this framework, we started thinking on how we could apply it to several species and evaluate diversity patterns at a broader scale, adding even more challenges because actually we should have to, to see, we must have we must think in terms of species specific parameters, which is, of course, we don't know. Um, we have this paper published in Frontier last 
frontiers of biogeography last year in which we modeled not the ranges, but the only the centers of the niche. We are modeling the peaks, right? Um, after all, most amphibian species have very, very small ranges. Uh, and actually, we showed the same thing. Um, you, can, you can see here in this diagram, this is not the probability of a rescue anymore, but this is the frequency of the species, right? So we have uh, about 7,000 species or something. And uh, the probability of rescue of, of the center of the niche is being able to, to track the environmental change uh, to the future is usually close to zero. There are a few species that for which the, the difference between current and future climates is not uh, large enough to, uh, to allow, uh, to, to generate an extinction. It's potentially, uh, uh, the, the persistence can happen under uh, evolutionary rescue, but it's a relatively low proportion of species. And um, we can map species richness, for example, now and in the future, so excluding those species with a very low probability of rescue. And what you can see here is the map of the remaining species. And this, this result basically matches what uh, other papers uh, predict for this, this same group with lots of extinctions in the tropics, mainly in the Amazon and in, in the Atlantic forest, as you can see here in some parts of of Africa, um, but this uh, there are many many ideas to to develop here. This is a work work in progress, so let's see how how it develops. Well, uh, we can then move to our last idea, and I'm I would like to show you uh, just another possibility to think in how to couple ENMs and more mechanistic evolutionary process, but now it's a much broader scale. Uh, in practice, this is almost a different area or better, uh, a different research program. There are different people involved, different ways to think, but uh, there are many interesting links with the ideas that we developed here. So, so, so let's take a look on this. I think that um, all these ideas uh, started in early 2000s, uh, most related to the development of Rob Caldwell's uh, mid-domain effect. Mid-domain effect is the, is the idea that if you reshuffle geographic ranges randomly, there would be a peak of species richness in the middle of the domain, of the region uh, we, are, we are working on. Uh, and this would be a new model in which no environmental factors drive species range and consequently no environmental factors that determine species richness. But uh, gradually, several research groups, including ours, started to use this basic framework of simulating ranges to add the environmental effects and to see how ranges and how richness uh, respond to this uh, addition of environmental changes and uh, what patterns uh, would emerge from this couple of models in which we have a new random distribution of ranges and uh, environmental effects drive new species. And one interesting thing here that started, not necessarily started here, but became, became very, very common, is to use virtual species. So we are creating artificial species with uh, known niche limits, for example, and to simulate the dynamics of these species. And um, eventually, we can even compare uh, richness patterns or range size frequency distributions of these virtual species generated under distinct processes with some uh, empirical data. But the focus is usually with virtual artificial species and to see how uh, which patterns which patterns uh, emerge from the dynamics. Of course, uh, we quickly added the evolutionary dimension to this idea and used niche conservatism to determine uh, species extinction and speciation through time. Uh, in this paper we published it in 2007, uh, the basic idea is that uh, if the climate change and the trailing edges is too large, the species go extinct. And moreover, um, when geographical isolation occurs, as suggested by Towns' 1999 paper in Science, uh, the new species generated by geographical isolation could keep the ancestral niche closed. The two species would be closed in terms of the niche or they can change a bit. And this would be 
uh, a parameter for the niche conservative, right? Uh, but in this model here, there is no adaptation in the sense we discussed before. What is really happening is that we have a species sorting. Uh, this process is, is generated by distinct balance between speciation and extinction in different parts of the environmental space. And there are now many papers uh, trying to use virtual species and to see uh, all these processes in environmental spaces, including, including some uh, very recent papers by by Towns and Jorge uh, group, right? Um, but more recently, we decided to incorporate the, the idea of evolutionary rescue and adaptation within ranges in this type of macroecological models. Uh, and we have this paper led by my friends Thiago Rangel and Rob Cowell, uh, published in Science a couple of years ago, uh, that among other, other things, we included the adaptation within ranges as an additional mechanism shifting species, niches, and ranges. Uh, let's see quickly uh, how it works. Uh, what we have here is that uh, we started someplace uh, with some random uh, created species based on uh, a, a, an environmental envelope, let's say uh, a niche here in terms, let's say, of precipitation and, and temperature, pre temperature and precipitation. And, and based on these limits, we projected a species in a geographical space. And the, the climate starts changing. And, and uh, when environment changes and create trailing edges, the trailing edges will adapt as we, we did before, as we showed before. Uh, and in this case, it, the, the, the model is a bit slightly more complicated because Tiago is not simulating the center of the niche, let's say the preferred temperature, but he is simulating the, the, the dynamics in maximum and minimum limits of the two variables. So these limits are evolving more or less independently. But anyway, uh, the adaptive processes that we discussed before is happening, are happening uh, in, the, in the range border, borders. Eventually, we have geographical speciation and then we have the niche conservatism parameter. The, 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 the evolution will take place among species. And uh, we can track here the uh, phylogenetic relationship among the species that will um, evolve, right? Let's see this dynamics here happening. You can see that the limits will shift. We have just one species for now. We will have an speciation. We have a different range. And if you look carefully here, you see that the, at each, in, in each time, there are slight changes here, so the trailing edges are responding also to climate change, not only the overall dynamics in terms of speciation creating and occupying the environmental and geographical space. Right? So um, that's it. Let's think about the main taking home messages of this talk. First, uh, ENMs are static correlative model, but it seems very nice to incorporate uh, dynamic ecological and evolutionary processes to better understand species ranges and their shifts under climate change, um, even in, in a relatively uh, short time. Of course, there are too many challenges in the senses, and I think it's hard to think that this will become, at least in a, in a short term, uh, a quick tool for ap applications, especially if many species are, are involved. But let's see, and in, in any way, it's very cool to think in, in all these, these processes, right? Uh, and second, I think that for coupling, coupling uh, ENMs and other types of mechanistic models, uh, we need a better integration among several fields in ecology and evolutionary biology. We, we also must uh, deal with many scaling issues, as we, we saw. Um, I, I would say the challenges of this integration, uh, they include uh, better knowledge of species tolerance curves, have more realistic response curves, and how experimental approaches at individual level will scale up to population level. Second, I think that we must uh, have a much better knowledge of the genetic basis of different niche dimensions and their correlation, which this is very challenging. Um, and finally, um, how ecological and geographical factors may interact to drive speciation, and this, 
thinking especially in this last part of the talk. I briefly show you the macroecological models. Anyway, uh, please do not be scared of all such challenges. This, these are actually opportunities. Indeed, much of these topics will be covered in much more details in the next, I, I'm sure that will be very nice talks of the ENM 2020 online course. Thank you very, very much for your attention and I hope that you have enjoyed the talk.